Don't despair, Mike. Under the Southern Cross, anything is possible. Oh, Star Tropics. When I decided I wanted to start doing YouTube, this is one game I knew I had to cover. Star Tropics is an action adventure game released in 1990 for the NES. It's about a high school ace pitcher named Mike Jones who is on a quest across tropical islands to find his lost uncle. This game has always been important to me as it was one of the first action games I beat growing up. Ever since then, I've played it every summer as kind of a tradition to myself. Anyways, enough about me. Time to get into the meat and potatoes of this review. Star Tropics has an interesting history. It was developed in Japan but never got a release there. It was only released in North America and Europe. As a game developed for an American audience, it uses some very stereotypical aspects. First of all, the two passcodes in the game are 1492 and 1776. Little American history lesson for you. 1492 was when Christopher Columbus landed on the Bahama Islands and started the colonization of America. And 1776 was the year of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. That might not be entirely accurate, but hey, I'm Canadian. Give me a break. Feel free to flame me in the comments below. Another interesting fact for you. In the original release, the main weapon you got was called a yo-yo. However, due to Canada copyright laws with the term yo-yo, it got changed to Island Star. Yay, Canada copyright laws! So this was originally going to be way longer, but I figured nobody wants to hear me go into excruciating detail about the story of Star Tropics. So here's the microwave version of the meat potatoes of Star Tropics. Our story begins with our not at all stereotypical American hero, G.I. Jones, an ace pitcher from the city of Seattle, off on a summer vacation to visit his archaeologist, Uncle Jones. No relation to Indiana. However, it appears he went missing after talking to every single NPC in the game, including a pig in his butthole. This happens in every town, by the way. You travel through a dungeon, fight some slugs and snakes, and eventually a snake boss. Then you meet your uncle's assistant, who advises you that your uncle has been abducted. He then lends you the subsea, which is your main vehicle of travel, and introduces you to Not Rob, also known as Navgrom. And here ends chapter 1. For the most part, this is how the gameplay loop works. Introduces you to the area, go through a dungeon or several dungeons, fight a boss, and move on to the next chapter. Each chapter has a theme. Chapter 1 serves as the intro, starting off your summer vacation and introduces you to the game mechanics. Chapter 2 introduces you to a dolphin and asks you to save her son. Chapter 3 is the longest chapter in the game. It starts with waking up a sleeping beauty. I use that term lightly. Then you have to find a crystal ball in the ghost village so the wizard can turn you into a woman so you can enter the old girl's castle, eventually making it to the top of the hermit's mountain so you can wake up the village chief's daughter. Chapter 4 is a very musical chapter that involves playing a giant piano and ends with sinking the giant ship blocking the strait. Interesting that it has an 8-bit rendition of My Country Tis of Thee. Chapter 5, this is the infamous chapter, is relatively short, involves getting swallowed by a giant whale, finding your way through the labyrinthine intestines, and starting a fire to get sneezed out. Honestly, I'm surprised Disney didn't sue over this. Anyways, this is the infamous letter scene. At this point in the game, it requires you to enter a certain frequency. This frequency is not found in the game at all. The original release had a letter from your uncle. In order to find the frequency, you had to dip this physical letter in water, and the frequency would appear. An awful mechanic was not repeated in any other game for obvious reasons. The Wii and Wii U version on the Virtual Console replicated this with a virtual letter, but the Switch version has nothing, so Google is your only option. The frequency is 747 for those who haven't figured it out in the past 25 years. Anyways, back to the chapters. Chapter 6 is where you finally track down your uncle and he tells you he was abducted by aliens because he has found three magic cubes. The aliens have since stolen those magic cubes and it's up to you to find these magic cubes again and get them back. This is where the star in Star Tropics happens. Chapter 7 is where the game not only goes sci-fi, but the difficulty ramps up substantially. The chapter is somewhat long and the game becomes unfair at times. You collect two cubes in this chapter, one which powers up your yo-yo of doom and another that maxes out your hearts. Chapter 8 is more of just a finale chapter. It's short and you found out the true villain is a leader of the aliens named Zoda. Basically a boss fight and a hallway to the final boss. World gets saved, they throw you a party, you shove bananas in your ears. What a fun vacation.
Gameplay in Star Tropics essentially has two different gameplay styles. You have the overworld, which resembles Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy. This is generally how you go from town to town or dungeon to dungeon, usually insists on talking to every single NPC to progress to the next point. This happens in every town. Then you have your dungeons. Dungeons are where the meat and potatoes of Star Tropics takes place. Dungeons are very similar to Zelda. Movement in dungeons takes place on a huge grid. This means no diagonal movement and you can only move one tile at a time. No half tiles or anything. This means that once you move in a direction, you're committed until you make the whole step. This gives a certain degree of strategy to the game. Furthermore, there's a delay when moving. When you press a directional key, you point in that direction, and a moment later, you actually move. Sounds confusing and frustrating, but it actually is designed that way intentionally. This way you can aim your attacks before you actually move all the way to the next tile. Once you get used to it, it works really well. To defeat your enemies, you have your basic yo-yo that gets powered up, or you can use your sub-weapons. Sub-weapons have a designated number of uses and disappear once you leave that dungeon. Some examples of sub-weapons you can find are a fire spewing torch, ninja stars, a baseball bat, or some bolas. But the coolest one has to be the spike cleats you get that make you invincible and warps you to each enemy doing damage. There are also some special items called magic items that have special uses, such as revealing ghosts, freezing the water, or restoring health. These can only be used by pausing the game. Personally, I feel the pixel art of Star Tropics has aged incredibly well. It's bright, it's colorful, and best of all, the game doesn't really recolor monsters for the most part. There are a few recolored monsters here, but most of them are different throughout the whole game. Which is nice, as Recolored Monsters was a trend that started in the NES era and continues until even today. The music of Star Tropics is kind of a mixed bag. I love the music, and it's great for about the first hour, but due to the same 3 to 5 songs being used throughout the whole game, it gets old relatively quickly. The dungeon theme is an absolute bop though. It's a high energy battle theme, and dungeon music is always worth it in my opinion. Star Tropics is a relatively short game by today's standards. The game can last you anywhere from 3 to 6 hours, depending on how lost you get. My playthrough for this review took about 3 hours, however, this is from someone who has played the game many, many times, and knows where all the secret walls are, and how to solve every puzzle in the game. The pacing can be kind of off in Star Tropics. For example, chapters 1, 2, and 5 are incredibly short, only taking 10 to 15 minutes apiece. However, there are other chapters, such as 3 and 7, are incredibly long and can be take upwards of 45 minutes to complete. I personally feel chapter 3 should have been separated into two chapters, as it felt really, really long. My final thoughts with Star Tropics is despite a few difficulty spikes and pacing issues, it is overall a very fun time. It feels like you're just playing through a summer vacation when that summer vacation gets abducted by aliens. If you enjoy Zelda or kooky stories full of bananas being shoved in your ears, I would definitely suggest playing it. Overall, despite the issues, I would give it either a 7 or 8 out of 10. I want to thank you for enjoying my Star Tropics review. This review was quite a bit longer than my other reviews, but I wanted to spend time talking about it as it's one of my favorite games of all time. Did you enjoy the review? Have you played Star Tropics before? Tell me about your experiences or your thoughts on the review in the comments below. That's the meat and potatoes, folks. I hope you have a wonderful day.